Roger Needles, Product Manager at Visual Sonics. Thank everyone for joining us on today's Q session at Vivo 2100 Cardiovascular, Cardiovascular Analysis. Uh, I'm joined today by Stephen Butters, uh, Stephen Application Specialist at Visual Sonics, works extensively with uh, 2100 uh, in cardiac imaging. Um, what we're trying is really a new format for us. Uh, we've done these webinar sessions in the past, but this is the first time we're really going to focus on more of a question and answer type forum. Um, this is based on feedback we had from many of uh, the listeners and users of the Vivo systems. Um, so we thought something new. We've got a number of questions that have uh, come in through the registration. Uh, people have, have posted questions. I see some people are starting to post questions uh, already using the chat window. Um, we are, I just want to make a few notes before we get started. We are recording today's session, uh, and as I mentioned, please use the chat window because all of the lines are going to be muted. Uh, this is really just allows us to give a good quality recording um, to make the background noise. So please use the chat window for all of your questions. We are happy to take questions uh, as we go. Uh, we will endeavor to get to all of them. A number of questions that have come in and are starting to come in. So in the event that we do not get to your question today, apologize in advance, um, but we will make every effort to contact you uh, directly uh, more of that discussion um, uh, at a time. We will provide at some point uh, our email addresses for both Stephen and myself so you can certainly follow up with us directly. Um, we expect a, a very short presentation today, just about five minutes, just to overview some of the basics of cardiovascular imaging with the Vivo. Approximately under 30, 35 minutes of question and answer session. Um, just a reminder again, uh, Visual Sonics offers a number of webinars, and again, thanks for joining us today. Please look at visualsonics.com slash webinars to look at future sessions, and please register for those. So I think we'll get started. I'll pass things over to Stephen. Uh, Stephen will short with, start a short presentation and uh, move into the Q&A session. Great. Thanks, Andrew. And, uh, good morning, everybody. Again, thanks for joining us. Um, so, uh, as Andrew said, we'll just uh, do a really quick uh, overview, and then uh, we'll move into uh, the actual uh, Vivo Square and uh, get a look at uh, some cardiovascular images. And uh, you know, everybody that's on there, please go ahead and uh, put questions in. Uh, as we have a few questions here that were submitted previously on registration, uh, we'll try and maybe answer those first. And then uh, we'll uh, play it by ear and see what comes up. So, sort of, uh, this, uh, we're going to start as, a, as a, just a basic overview, really just to get everybody on the same page. Uh, I want to just to get everybody thinking about uh, what the 2100, the Vivo 2100 system is, what it does, what it can do in, in terms of cardiovascular imaging. Um, and here, looking at uh, things like. Um, B mode, uh, grayscale B mode images uh, measured, uh, measuring the uh, left ventricle here with the LV trace tool, um, and combining uh, color Doppler uh, and pulse wave Doppler together to look at flow in vessels. Uh, those of you joining us who uh, um, who uh, don't have a 2100 uh, yet, maybe have a 70, the uh, B mode LV trace and the PW Doppler may be uh, uh, fair to you, but the color Doppler is not. Color Doppler is a 20 Vivo 2100 only uh, application, and it works very nicely for uh, cardiovascular imaging to look at uh, fast flowing vessels, what you can see here in the pulmonary artery, and then uh, home in on those uh, specific areas to do your pulse wave Doppler measurements. And of course, any of us that are familiar with the system know uh, the, the large array of measurements and calculations that are available in the cardiovascular packages, both in the 770 and in the 2100 as well. Uh, just some examples here of some stuff in, uh, in measurements in mitral valve and um, in uh, electrical. Um, moving to more uh, advanced analysis, the 2100 uh, also has the capability to have the Vivo Strain software added onto it, which is uh, uh, an endocardial epicardial uh, spectral tracking software. It allows you to look at uh, displacement strain, strain rate in um, the short 
the long axis, the radial longitudinal and circumferential directions. So uh, it does uh, produce a lot of data. It's very fine analysis. This, again, is a, a 2100-only thing. Uh, we did have a question that was submitted earlier uh, during the registration process about vivo strain. So uh, I will get to vivo strain in a little bit. Uh, I'll show um, more of the, um, the, the basic uh, vivo software and some of the basic measurements first, just to answer some of the questions. The vivo strain is uh, what we consider uh, to be a, a post-analysis, uh, post-capture analysis, and sort of more high-level uh, analysis that allows you to really drill down more deeply into the data. Um, and then just some things to be aware of. Um, again, people that have used the system already or uh, are maybe thinking about using it, there's a lot of uh, adjustments that you can make to your images, uh, depth, width, uh, gain, uh, choice of transducer. Uh, these have um, a lot of effects on your data. Uh, really, I mean, it's, it's a it's a garbage in, garbage out situation. As, as with most things, you really have to try to uh, plan ahead. Really uh, select the best tools. Really work um, sort of in your pilot studies to to develop um, presets and develop settings that really work well um, for your particular uh, subject animal, your particular models. Uh, again, to choosing the transducers. All the transducers for the system have uh, uh, specific uh, attributes, things like the maximum Doppler that they can go to. There was a question that came in about uh, TAC uh, models, so we'll, I'll, I'll mention that in, in a little bit when we actually look at the data. Uh, things like the depth and field of view to, to plan for for uh, the types of imaging that you want to do. You really need to, to do some planning ahead. Um, all of what I just said also goes for the 770 as well. Transducer choice uh, is uh, very important on the 770, especially because the, the, a lot of the attributes for the, the transducers on the 770 are fixed. Uh, one thing you can do nicely on the 2100 uh, is uh, have this uh, ability to have applications and presets. So when I mentioned about the, the various sections of the images, you can create your own presets on the 2100, which is nice. And I really try to promote people doing that. It's very important to to have presets, to have presets that are working for you, for your models, and to really um, really uh, uh, have those planned ahead of time and be able to uh, standardize things in your uh, in your experiment. So uh, and those are the things that you see here in this block uh, can be set as, as, uh, as presets and saved uh, in your system. Uh, and just some, some important things, and this also looks for the 770, the gain settings are very important uh, because the gain settings actually uh, change the underlying data uh, on the system, uh, the, the, the uh, brightness or the, uh, or the darkness, quote unquote darkness of the image, uh, can make it more or less challenging to do your, uh, your measurements later on. Uh, with, uh, other things uh, like the brightness and the contrast uh, on the 2100 specifically, again, things like the dynamic range and the display map, these are all uh, things that can be changed uh, afterwards. Uh, post capture. So, just some uh, important uh, things to, to think about when you're doing acquisition. Um, that concludes the, the PowerPoint uh, part of uh, the presentation. So, um, just had a very quick, very basic overview of the 2100s uh, and just about a couple of the modes and things the uh, BMO, color Doppler, pulse wave, and uh, I mentioned Vivo strain and some of the image settings. So, I'll move into the Vivo Square right now. So this uh, uh, this is the Vivo uh, 2100 software for uh, analysis, uh, for post analysis. And one of the uh, questions uh, that we got ahead of time uh, was a, a two part question. The, the first one was um, uh, taking a consistent heart ultrasounds uh, for mice over time. So uh, a couple of things that I wanted to point out with that. Uh, one thing uh, would obviously be the, the positioning of the uh, of the animal uh, in the um, in the imaging session. So that would be very uh, important for uh, how the image is oriented. So actually, I've got two images that I'm up here to show. Um, the first one, uh, this is uh, obviously long axis left ventricle. You can see that the uh, the airflow track and the apex are not lined up with each other. They're fairly close, but the apex is kicked up a little bit. This uh, image, which is from the same animal, the same imaging session, is just following a slight adjustment. And uh, this one here, which is uh, even better. So in this one, the uh, the 
get full tracked and the apex are a little bit more lined up. It just comes from animal positioning, from using the uh, the rail system, using the, the table, uh, the ball joint where the, the underneath the uh, table where the mouse is to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, proper angles and positioning. Now, these can vary a lot between animals, uh, even between different animals, uh, different uh, species, uh, or sorry, different, not species, but different strains. Um, uh, and even between um, the same animals uh, from the same cages uh, from in, in different imaging sessions, you may notice sometimes that the, the heart is in uh, one position in uh, one animal and then one of its cage mates, one of its litter mates, the heart is, is twisted a bit or turned a bit or the pex is turned up a little bit towards the, uh, the rib cage. So, um, Play around with the angles a lot. Play around with the the angle of the ball joint underneath the table where the animal is, and uh, also uh, the angle of the transducer and how that relates to um, the, uh, the the way that the transducer is sitting across the animal's chest. We do have an image guide, um, imaging guides both for the 770 and the 2100, uh, available on our customer website, uh, and I can flip into uh, the PDF of the imaging guide maybe in a little bit uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about animal positioning as it uh, as it uh, as it comes up um, in terms of consistency being consistent and taking consistent measurements and, and taking consistent images across time uh, and the temperature are very very important um, the heart rate and the temperature are displayed here uh, on the bottom below the image, you have the uh, ECG trace and the respiration trace, and then the uh, the body temperature uh, here. These are all, of course, monitored off of the table, those of you out there that are using the system. It's very important to monitor the heart rate of the animal and really manage the depth of the isoflurane uh, or whatever anesthesia you happen to be using in the animals and not to depress the heart rate too far. And uh, as we've discovered that body temperature really has a critical effect on uh, the heart rate and the blood pressure and the animal physiology. Uh, so using the, the heat of the table, but also using a heat lamp above and uh, weather imaging, keeping an eye on that body temperature and really trying to keep it in a tight range if, if anything else, if you, if you can almost uh, have more, uh, for lack of a better term, the heart rate, if you maintain the body temperature uh, within a very tight range, the heart rate and the physiology will follow from there. So uh, those are, are really important uh, things for, for being consistent, um, just monitoring the physio data and really trying uh, to keep it consistent. Um, Optimizing the images, we mentioned the um, uh, the positioning, uh, the positioning of the transducer. One thing I wanted to point out here in this image are the shadows. So, uh, depending on the resolution of the screen, uh, what you're looking at as this is coming through here, there's a shadow right here, and there's another shadow right here. Uh, those rib shadows will always be there, but you can move them around a little bit with a positioning of the transducer and uh, the animal. So. What I often tell people is um, if you're interested in, say, the, the AV valve and uh, the coronary arteries and things that are going up here at the base of the heart, push the shadows down to, to the left, towards the, uh, on the left of the screen, towards the apex of the heart, uh, and then you get a clearer image of the base of the heart. Conversely, if you're looking at something like uh, infarct models where the infarcts tend to be down in the apex, push the rib shadows uh, up towards the base of the heart so that you get a clearer image of uh, the apex and the infarct regions and the, the hinge, hinge points uh, between the uh, uh, between the infarct and the, the normal tissue. So um, just a positioning thing strictly, and then also optimizing things like I mentioned in the, the short PowerPoint there, things like the gain, uh, the dynamic range, uh, the width and depth. These will have uh, the width and the depth and the line density on the 2100 will have a, a very huge effect on the frame rate. Frame rates are very important. Uh, the higher the frame rate, you can get the best. So you can have an effect on the frame rate uh, by using the cardiology application. The presets in the cardiology application already have things uh, optimized for higher frame rates. And then play around with the settings and create your own presets uh, with uh, things like the width, the depth, 
uh, and to try and bring the frame rates up, and then you can to try to uh, increase, increase the noise. Uh, with dynamic range, you can uh, try to increase or decrease the grayscale. Um, I often equate dynamic range to uh, contrast setting because it will increase or decrease the amount of gray versus the amount of black and white in the image. And sometimes uh, a lower dynamic range in cardiovascular imaging is a bit better because it makes the image a little sharper around the endocardium. obvious uh, on the screen to anybody that's, that's people that have never looked at a 2100 image before, but there's a line right here along the scale. This line represents where the, the TGC, the time gain correction settings are. On the 770, there's actually a, a software block up here in the corner of the TGC settings. On the 2100, these are hardware uh, on the keyboard. And so they need to adjust the gain throughout the depth of the image, and often for cardiovascular imaging, we will drop the gain at the top to try to reduce some of the brightness from the skin line and also drop the gain at the bottom to try and reduce some of these compression artifacts that you see in the uh, in the far wall in the image. So uh, lots of, of settings on the system, on both systems, but especially on the 2100, um, and, um, and, and play around with them to try and really optimize your images. The question that came in uh, about whether or not presets are available on the 770, uh, the most accurate answer for that is sort of. Uh, the presets are not available on the 20 on the 770, sorry, in the same way that they are on the 2100, where you have a clear indication here that you have a preset uh, up in the upper left of the screen, uh, and that you have a preset, a save preset button, where you save, hit a hit a save preset button and it pops up, and you can give it a name. That's all very 2100 specific. On the 770, if you make your settings for uh, width and depth, which on the 770 are sector X and sector Y. You can adjust things like the window, which changes the offset and the depth offset, and uh, also the, um, uh, the the view, sort of viewing level where the uh, where the window is. Change your TGC settings uh, on the screen, and then you can actually go to operator preferences, and in the operator preferences window, there is a, a, a set of buttons, one says uh, load custom, save custom, uh, and that's actually a, a custom file that has the sector X, sector Y, the TGC, that also has the uh, the global system gain setting as well, uh, and also I believe the image uh, invert, the left-right uh, invert on the image is uh, saved to, uh, to that file as well. To give you a clear indication on the screen, uh, on the 770 that you have uh, that preset, but if you know uh, it's a specific preset, you can just go into that operator preferences window and uh, and recall it and uh, work with it uh, from there. So on to a um, uh, question that was sent in uh, earlier. This is also a two-part question. Um, this is uh, specifically about that imaging, and I'm actually just realizing right now that I don't think I have any rat kernel, but I do have some rat liver, so uh, not exactly within the area that we want to look at, but I will bring up one image just to point something out, uh, and that's actually not what I was expecting. Let me try something else. Okay, so when we do rat imaging, Rat cardio. We usually use the MS250. Obviously, this is a, a rat liver, uh, but I just wanted to bring up uh, this image just to show the panel here. So the uh, MS250 probe is a 21 megahertz center frequency probe. Um, and you, uh, and those of you that know that have used the system, is that have different transducers or that have uh, worked with ultrasound a bit, and change the frequency. So as you go down the frequency, you uh, drop resolution. So one of the, the parts in this question was about the image quality um, not sharp with the MS-250 as it maybe is with the MS-400, which is the 30 megahertz center frequency, or with the 550D, which is a 40 megahertz center frequency probe. That's another one that we uh, that we tend to use sometimes for uh, mouse cardio imaging. So traditionally on the 2100, the mouse, mouse cardio imaging would be done with uh, 30 or a 40 megahertz center frequency uh, probe, depending on the size of the animal, uh, versus uh, rat is generally done with this probe.
probe with yeah, the 21 megahertz frequency. Change that frequency, you change the resolution. So you actually have different uh, slice thickness, a different axial and lateral resolutions between the probes, and you end up with uh, different speckles. So the speckle sizes on the, the lower frequency probes, the lower you go, the bigger the speckle sizes. And uh, it, it gives the appearance that the image is a bit cleaner. Uh, something that can throw people off sometimes uh, on our systems, the 770 and the 2100, both as compared to a clinical system, is that we don't do the amount of uh, pressing, smoothing, uh, or using persistence and things uh, the clinical systems do. Clinical systems do a lot of post-processing before the image is even displayed, and it tends to give a smoother um, image. Our images tend to look a little bit grainier to people that are clinical systems, and it's because we don't do that that, that processing of the image. Uh, we don't tend to use persistence. You can see here on the left side that the persistence is shown as off here. Uh, persistence is available on the system, but we don't tend to use it unless it uh, is called for in uh, something uh, very specific. I, I've used it sometimes in, um, say, contrast imaging of a tumor, or sometimes even in liver imaging, just to kind of smooth the uh, the granularity of the organ out a little bit. So um, it's nice to see that. I can actually show you here. This is, a, again, a 250 image, and if we go back to a previous image that I had here, this is... So this is also that liver image, but this is with the 400, and it doesn't look as quite rainy. And then if we look at the previous B mode images that we had up here, these are with the 550D. So up in frequency between these three images, we've gone up from 21 to 40 megahertz. So it's a lot smoother because the pixel size is a lot smaller. Um, so that's one aspect of, uh, or sorry, one part of this question. The, another part of the question had uh, was about, uh, and again, specifically with the MS250 with frame rate uh, and going to vivo strain. So this gives me a good lead in to go to vivo strain. So um, I've got, actually got some vivo strain uh, data here already that I'll call up. Uh, I'll go to the actual image first just to have a look at it. Frame rate, very important with vivo strain. Um, uh, box we feel from the uh, testing and the usage that we've done here is around 120 frames per second. So you never have to worry about that with mice, that 120, um, because the image is, again, we're uh, at higher frequency, the uh, actual size of the image is smaller, the resolution is greater, so uh, the frame rates tend to be quite a bit higher. However, when you go to rat cardio imaging, um, you're using that 21 megahertz probe again, so you end up with a, a much lower frame rate. You really have to work to optimize the imaging. So in biology, uh, the presets are normally going to have standard line density. And they're also normally going to have one focal zone. Uh, that's going to drive the frame rate up. But with the 250, with the 21 megahertz probe, you're going to be getting right around the edge of 100, 110, 115. 120 frames with just the basic settings. So you have to work a little bit to optimize the width of the image. You run into issues with older animals that have larger hearts or, uh, say, uh, animals that have um, uh, hypertension models, uh, things like that, where they're getting hypertrophy, uh, where the hearts are enlarging. You may have some issues there where you can't quite fit the whole heart of the screen. So you have to sacrifice a bit. Um, now, on this image here, Actually, just let me play a little bit so we can see. To do the strain, we really need the endocardium and the epicardium of the heart. We don't really need the uh, the aortic outflow tract and the uh, right ventricular outflow tract and pulmonary uh, here. So we could actually trim this inch width in. If you can see where I'm making a line with the arrow here, we could trim the width in to right at the base, right at the AV valve. As long as we don't lose the apex here, so that we can keep the edge of the image here, and on the, on the beats obviously, and on the rest, on the in, uh, peaks of inspiration as the animal is breathing, things are moving a little bit, so you have to have a little bit of wiggle room on both sides. But you need to squeeze that image right in. And if you think about uh, what we'll I'll show in a few minutes when I go actually go into vivo strain, really with vivo strain, are only looking at a section from about here on the endocardium around to about here. Uh, frame rates are, are getting tight. If you can try, if you, 
the heart large if you need to squeeze it. You can actually squeeze it in a little bit more and even go past the AV valve. As long as the apex and the whole area that you want to trace of the evil strain, then you're going to be fine in terms of, uh, of analysis for data. So I'll jump into vivo strain. I just want to double check and make sure, yes, this is the image that I already have. So we'll go and it takes a few seconds to load. Vivo do, uh, in applications, we do tend to recommend doing vivo strain on uh, a workstation, on a laptop or a, or a desktop uh, system, rather than on the imaging system itself. Uh, this is assuming, of course, that you have a, a desktop uh, or, or, or a a workstation install available. The computer inside the imaging station is, is dedicated really to driving the, uh, the the boards and actually doing image acquisition. And it's uh, the specifications on it are, are a little bit lower than it might be for, uh, say, current laptops and current desktops. So the amount of processing that people strain requires uh, does uh, tend to, to, to you know, uh, work better on uh, on a desktop, on a modern desktop or a laptop. So. This is the, the vivo strain main analysis window. Um, so uh, this, uh, I just realized I just skipped a step. So we can actually go back to the mode selection. Um, so with vivo strain, this is the window that you're going to be presented with. Uh, you need to draw an anatomical M mode line down here, which I have. So this is just a single click left and then left. This will give you the anatomical M mode window across here. This will give you to select uh, some some periods, some sections to do the actual analysis with. Uh, so to train, uh, two things to, to remember. Um, no good idea to load more than 300 frames in vivo strain. 300 frames is a lot of data. 300 frames will give you this long anatomical M mode strip to work with. So this this is a lot of tools to work with. For vivo strain analysis, you really only need to do two or three uh, cycles for analysis. You don't need to do four or five, six. You're really just uh, increasing the amount of data and increasing the processing time by doing that. It's, it's really not necessary. So that's what where I say uh, make sure that you're only putting around 300 frames in. <clears throat> that will give you the selection, uh, the ability to select uh, a, a few uh, cardiac cycles here. Um, for anybody that's interested, when I pop back out to the regular Vivo software, I'll show you how to change the amount of frames that you're putting into Vivo Strain. Um, so when you have this anatomical M mode line down, you get this uh, panel across here. Now you can select the segments, this, the cycles that you actually want to we can move this slider and we can uh, take these few cycles here. Uh, if you're doing freehand scanning and you don't have the ECG, uh, the R waves may or may not be detected. You can actually delete the R waves. So if I hover over here, there's an, uh, there's an X. Uh, I can actually delete these R waves and I can put R waves back in if I go to the area where I see uh, the full day. And again, they're a little bit out of sync. So I can put more waves in. So this works if you have, uh, say, if you're doing freehand scanning, or uh, if you didn't have the animal hooked up to the physiology where you where you have the ECG, you can actually uh, add and subtract your own R waves. So when you have the uh, segment selected, set your trace. This is a long distance. We're going to do cardial and epicardial tracing at the same time. I recommend for trading going beyond roughly about this point, because uh, beyond here, you're getting into the area where you're bumping up against the RVOT in the pulmonary, and uh, the motion uh, here in this thinner septum area tends to be a little bit different. And the same down here, you're, you're sort of getting close to, depending on your view, the atria and the mitral valve down here. So to keep, uh, to keep your tracing a little bit shorter, uh, I think some of the literature that we have for vivo strain that we produced early on had a extending the tracing right out to the to the edges here. And we've discovered over time that that's maybe not the best approach, that uh, doing something like this is a little bit better, uh, just to keep it a little bit smaller. So then we'll go in, we'll run the analysis. So now we're into the tracing that we had here before. So now we've got the, what we call the main analysis screen, so we can play our image. We can look at the vectors. So there's a setting over here on the right side for vectors, looking at trace points, so you can see how the points are moving through the different cycles. 
or to look at the uh, actual tracing itself. So this is a kind of a nice view because it shows you the, the twisting uh, and compression motion of the heart altogether. Uh, we have lectures uh, obviously up across the top here for uh, things like velocity, displacement, uh, strain we can look at, uh, and strain rate. So the two segments here, radial strain, longitudinal strain, it's very important for people with strain is uh, if you do the endocardial tracing but not the cardial tracing, you will get data for radial strain. The data for radial strain is, is arbitrary. Uh, it's not necessarily reproducible. It's just the way the software works. So what we recommend is, is the endocardial and epicardial tracings together. And that way the radial and the longitudinal, or if we were doing axis tracing, and this would be circumferential instead of longitudinal, uh, the information will be correct and will be reproducible. So um, we're getting up here here, and here in these graphs is a mapping of all of the points. We can actually go and select a few individual points. And you can see if I get a point here at the apex, you can see on the tracing as I'm clicking to place points, colored dots showing me where those points are on the endocardium. And that's how we've got the tracing at the top here. So we've just got these three individual lines now for a point. So you don't have to deal with all 48 points all at once. You can choose to select a few, three, two, three, four uh, points uh, in, uh, in uh, different sections that you, uh, that you want. And to do that, obviously, you get them for longitudinal and, uh, and radial both. And then we change through strain rates, or back to velocity, we're getting uh, those for just those points specifically. If we want to go back to uh, mapping all PN, just click here to reset and set back to mapping all points. That's just endocardium down here in the history, simple tracing. So if you have uh, uh, tracing that you're sort of not happy about, you can do a number, uh, or you can, you can go back and edit the previous one that you did, or you can actually go and create a new trace, and those histories will accrue here. Uh, we can flip to the epicardium now, so you can see up here on the uh, B-mode image, the vector points have flipped out onto the epicardium. Same selectors, velocity, displacement, strain, strain rate, mapping the individual points. Down bottom left here, we've got uh, some systolic and diastolic parameters, uh, ejection fraction, uh, and the LV masses. Uh, and also the change in volume by the change in time mapped here. So uh, that's a quick overview of the main analysis screen. Uh, these are exportable. You can export AVIs, JPEGs. You can export a CSV file of all of these data as well. And then if you go to the time peak analysis, you get uh, time to peak uh, chain in this case, radial and longitudinal. For this particular cycle, so this red box here uh, gives you uh, the cycle, and you can actually jump to um, different cycles. Uh, where did that box go? I forget where that is. You jump through to uh, different cardiovascular cycles. You can actually also adjust the uh, size of the box here as well and take in a couple of uh, cycles if you want to average. Um, a lot of people seem to like this screen because it takes the heart quickly divides it up into six arbitrary sections and gives you the time to peak uh, is in milliseconds, the peak percentage of strain, radial, and longitudinal. The segments uh, are here, uh, so it gives you one, two, three, four, five, six numbered. It gives you a asterisk here to show you where it actually starts numbering. So it's uh, posterior base, posterior mid, posterior apex, and it flips back over to base, mid, and apex on the anterior side as well. Uh, and uh, you the, uh, oh, I remember where that button is now. There's a, an R to R button here that allows you to jump to the different uh, cardiovascular cycles. So you can sum through and look at the uh, different cycles that, uh, based on the R waves uh, that uh, the system is traced out. So you can just cycle through and look at the average. Again, these are all exportable as well. Um, so that these data are uh, exportable to CSV files. So uh, you can get those data. I will say that. Uh, a lot of data. Uh, CSV files are big. Uh, they have a lot of data in them. They have uh, all of these numbers uh, for each uh, component, so velocity, displacement, strain, and strain rate, by time, uh, based on frame, and by point, which is 
48 points. So you get uh, a C file is divided up into huge blocks of, uh, of data that you can then sift through. I would highly recommend doing that with Excel macros or some sort of scripting language like Perl or Python. Uh, dealing with that, that amount of data by hand is, uh, is, is, is pretty difficult. Um, so I definitely recommend uh, making friends with somebody that's uh, pretty good at uh, doing some uh, scripting programming in uh, Excel or in Python to help uh, deal with that amount of data. I did want to go back to the Vivo software for a second, and I wanted to point out the adjustment that you can make here. And actually, I will go to a different study that has uh, some long uh, here, these clips are a thousand frames long. If you remove Vivo Strain, I would not recommend putting that many frames into Vivo Strain. It's a lot of data, it will slow the system down, and uh, you may end up with uh, some weird errors from uh, things like buffer overflow and memory issues. So I would recommend uh, making uh, the, uh, the, the clip smaller before you go into Vivo Strain, and you do that here at the side where it says one or one here, you see a little hand pops up. You can click that and move it down to three, which is a more reasonable size clip. Now, when you go into Vivo Strain, it will take these 300 frames and put those into Vivo Strain. And you don't have to select those 300 frames, obviously. You can select frames from any section. So if there's a, a particular segment of a clip that you like, uh, this is especially useful if you're freehand scanning moving around sometimes or maybe uh, only a small segment of the, of the clip that you actually like for uh, positioning or for view or for shadowing or something. So make adjustments there and then go into Vivo Strain and then that will uh, make uh, managing the data considerably easier. So I think that's about it for the previously submitted questions. We did have a question that came in, a question that came in so if we want to maybe go through those. Yeah, I think Stephen touched on the, the first uh, part of this, which was about the TAC models. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit about uh, TAC models, some of the, the challenges with, um, really the question is, uh, it's across, the cross banding pressure is very high and the flow velocity is very high. Uh, and specifically, uh, this user was using the 770 um, switch to a lower frequency transducer, the 710B. Uh, which is a 25 megahertz yeah. transducer. Um, as a result, they can see much higher velocities. Uh, considering how that then would performs on the 2100, if you can, because they don't have the 2100, so they're interested to know how we would how we would deal with that issue on the on the 2100. And you could just speak a bit about the relationship between center frequency and maximum velocity. Sure. So I've just got a, a nice B mode image here of a uh, attack model uh, that I pulled up. So you can see in the uh, aortic arch, you can actually see where the suture is right here and how the uh, ascending aorta is ballooned out right here. This is actually done with uh, the 550B with the 40 megahertz probe. So as Andrew alluded to, um, and to increase, uh, there's a, a lot of relationship between various aspects of transducers. So I, I talked, when I talked about the imaging and, and the imaging with the 250 and speckle size and resolution, how uh, that changes. Your field of view changes, your uh, your depth of focus, your depth of field. One of the things that changes with frequency is the maximum Doppler uh, cap uh, capability of the probe. So as you, uh, as you uh, increase the frequency, the maximum speed of Doppler that you're going to be able to measure decreases. So imaging uh, models with a 550D, you're going to get really beautiful images of the uh, aortic arch, you're going to get really beautiful images of the uh, left ventricle, but uh, the maximum velocity that you're going to be able to measure up to with Doppler is not necessarily uh, high enough to uh, get to where you, uh, you need so uh, in terms of what the flows are. So if we look here with color Doppler, that we've actually gone to the MS-250 probe, uh, and uh, this has gone down to, because we're in Doppler, it says 16 megahertz. So remember, the 250 is the one that I talked about before that's a, 20, that's a 21 megahertz center. Doppler, the, the, the frequency drops down. We've got that because the flow are so high here, that on the, on the, uh, the uh, downside of the uh, downstream side of the suture, 
we're at uh, you know, 4,800, uh, 4.8 meters per second flow coming out of the, uh, the downstream side of the suture. Uh, we've had to drop down to that probe to get uh, um, Doppler velocity up to the area where we can uh, measure. So changing probes is, uh, is, is one uh, important aspect. Uh, I guess maybe going back even before changing probes, uh, having um, models that don't necessarily have extremely high flows. So if you go back to, say, design of experiment and work with uh, the models to, to maybe not get flows that are off the chart for um, for that particular probe that you have. And, uh, speak, I actually just alluded to that. Speaking of chart, if anybody is uh, interested and wants to know, either contact Andrew or myself. We do have a, a Doppler frequency chart um, that uh, we made up that shows all of the probes for the 2100 and the maximum Doppler uh, speeds that they're uh, able to, to get up to. So that might actually help you uh, maybe do some design of experiment to figure out uh, if you've only got, say, a 550D or you've only got a 400, how can you reliably go to measure? Um, and then uh, if you uh, have the flexibility to go to a, even a lower frequency, a 250 probe, then uh, you can drive those uh, velocities up a lot harder. Uh, big thing uh, is going to be positioning. So when we get up to the velocity, it says PRF here, which is pulse repetition frequency. But on a 2100 keyboard, the knob is actually the velocity knob, and it adjusts that. So we've cranked it up. Uh, that cranking that velocity, that PRF up, changes the scale here. So we've maxed it out here to 125 kilohertz. Um, when you get that high velocity on the Doppler line, you will see these T bars here. In 70, you would actually see uh, extra gates. You would actually see extra sample volume gates here. Uh, teal bars, and uh, you, there's actually an extra sample volume gate just out of view here. You can't quite see it. That's due to uh, pulse wave Doppler physics. Um, so what you need to do is focus on the uh, sample volume gate that is in the middle here that has the, the angle line on it. The other ones don't have an angle correction line on it. So you need to focus on the one that has the angle correction line on it. And they also need to keep it away from these teal colored bars. These are block out zones. They have to do with pulse wave Doppler physics. Uh, I won't bore anybody with the, the, the nitty gritty details of that, but, but measuring pulse wave Doppler within those block out zones is, uh, will be at lower velocity and will be less reliable than it is if you are out of those teal out of those block out zones and within this area. So is just simply positioning. The depth, the actual physical depth of the transducer as it relates to the animal on the um, on the, the probe clamp. Uh, because these uh, blockout zones don't move. They stay static on this line, but as you move the Doppler sample volume gate, this, this area here, as you move this up and down, you can actually move it up and down the line. So if you physically position the, the suture here, this is a really good position because the downstream side of the suture is right here, which is right middle of the uh, the area to measure, then uh, we're well away from the block out zones. We can play the, uh, we can place the sample volume gate right here in the middle and get the best measurement. So uh, so those are sort of all the, the the range of things that I would say that you need to, to look at to uh, to adjust. Um, in terms of comparison between the 770 and the 2100, uh, the 770 is is a very capable uh, system of, of measuring. Um, Doppler general and TAC model specifically. The probe that you have, the 710B, is a good probe uh, for doing that. Again, it's a 25 megahertz center frequency probe, so that's going to get you fairly high um, maximum Doppler. I would say that um, you probably come close to that with the MS400 probe on the 200. That's the 30 megahertz center frequency probe. You're going to sacrifice just a little bit. Um, I think the I think the MS400 drops from 30 down to around 26 or 27 megahertz for Doppler, so it's really close to where the 710B is. Uh, if you do have models that are uh, showing jets that are higher, then you may have to go down to um, the MS250 probe, the even lower frequency probe, just to get your uh, your maximum velocity. Okay. That's, that's great. And I just wanted to everyone, we did add our um, our email addresses for both Steve and myself. We can, if you have more specific questions, and, and for this specific listener who is asking about these, these 
scalar velocities, we can certainly send along the uh, that sheet that you were talking about that allows you to calculate ahead of time. But I, I think yeah, the, the point that see, sometimes you, there really is a trade-off in terms of the resolution uh, and the maximum velocity. So the point I'd add, there's actually a, a, another transducer called the MS-250. Um, we specifically uh, test for shallow uh, imaging at 20 megahertz. So that's again a nice, um, a nice way of looking uh, with a bit better resolution at, uh, at frequencies to give those high, high velocity. Um, just to just to clarify, we will uh, email uh, the document out to uh, to the listener that was asking about um, the maximum velocity. If anyone else is interested. And that, please let us know um, with a quick email. Um, there is a follow-up question from the same listener, but I, I think that question is probably better dealt with offline. It was very detailed in terms of how to plan for a specific view. So, yeah. um, in that case, we will we will take that one offline because I don't think we're really going to do it just here um, uh, over the WebEx. And there's actually one other question that came in. Um, of borders between IVCT T T in Doppler flow analysis. Could you uh, explain them? So if you could just clarify with people who aren't sure those what some of the acronyms are I V C T A T sure. B R T T. Uh, sure. Um actually start with a image this image uh, of the apical four chamber view. So we've got left ventricle here, uh, uh, intraventricular here, right ventricle here, just slightly shadowed by the sternum, uh, and then uh, left ventricle and right ventricle down here. So we're looking for in this image, uh, and again on 2100, we have the capability to go with and look color Doppler. We want to for mitral valve flow. So if we look at color Doppler, we can see it's actually not a great image. Let's go and see if I had a better one. No, I don't have a better one. Okay. For with color Doppler, this blue flash over here, let me speed up the play a little bit. So the blue flash, red blue flash over there that we're looking for, that's the mitral valve flow. So if we go at now, so now we found the four chamber view in B mode, checked it with color Doppler. So we're looking, we know for sure that we're looking at the uh, correct flow. Uh, we're looking at the mitral valve. Now we go ahead and we place our Doppler sample volume line. We get the mitral valve flow. So we've got a mitral valve trace here. This is very typical. Again, this is a, a normal mouse, nice mitral valve trace. The heart rate was 460 BPM, so the separation between the uh, the uh, E and the AP is, is pretty good. If we go to measurement panel, we mitral valve flow. Here's where we get the acronyms that uh, Andrew mentioned in this question: IVRT, IVCT, NFT. Um, if, if you're working on the system at any time, uh, well, actually, back even before that, in the uh, user's manual for the system, in the appendices in the back, uh, all of the um, measurement packages are detailed. All of the acronyms are um, are uh, laid out for all of the different measurement packages. So all of these acronyms are all broken down uh, and all of those as measurements, and then the calculations that are subsequently derived from those uh, measurements are also laid out. So when you get your report and you see things like uh, uh, MVAET or uh, you know LVCO, things like that, those are all laid out in the appendices of the user's manual. If you don't have a big bulky user's manual handy, when you're on the system, health is accessible um, from the uh, study browser. Um, for anybody that's using the system, this is a slightly different appearance of the study browser. I'm actually running an, an alpha build of the software. So on your uh, systems right now, because you have the, uh, you're have you still running the, the currently released software, there'll be a help button up here. When you go to that, you can actually get the operator manual, and all sections of the operator manual are laid out here. It's searchable. So if you're in front of the system and you're wondering about something specific and you've got a few minutes, you can flip through the operator manual there. 
note, though, that's really handy for uh, when you're imaging is pull up the measurement package and any protocol from the measurement package and go to the help button here. Now, with the help for the A flow protocol, which is the one that I selected, all of the measurement acronyms are all defined, and all the calculations which will be derived from those measurements are defined. If I go back to the image and select M flow, mitral valve flow, go to the help. Now we have the help for the mitral valve. And again, all of the acronyms and all of the um, calculations which are subsequently derived from those. So to look these up here, so the acronyms are IVRT and IVCT are the isovolumic uh, relaxation and contraction times. NFT and AET are the non-filling and the aortic ejection times. So uh, the placement of these measurements uh, are laid out in the measurement guide. Again, so I recommend uh, going to checking out the customer website and uh, looking at the measurement guide. Um, to place the measurements, I'm actually going to increase the sweep speed because the way it is right now, if this is very tight together, it's sometimes very hard to see where to place these measurements. So I want to actually increase the sweep speed down here in this slider, and I'm going to stretch those peaks way because I want to see bases in between them because this is where the IVRT and IVCT measurements go. Now, one other thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to slightly increase the brightness just to kind of brighten the lines up a little bit. Just a, a personal thing that I want to do. So I think relaxation time is the point where the flow comes back up to the line to the beginning of the EP. We'll move that out of the way. The volumic contraction time is on the other side. So if you think of the relaxation happens before the E peak, and then the contraction happens after the A peak. So that's where the A peak hits the line, and where the ejection starts to happen. So I want to move that up out of the way. So that's T in your IVCT. IVRT goes on the, on the left of the E peak before the E peak hits. And the IVCT, the contraction, goes on the downside just after the AAP when everything's down shut. The non flow time and the aortic ejection time go here. So this is the aortic ejection time. So this is this whole bounce stream side flow is actually flowing out. This is the aortic ejection right here. The non flow time is the entire span from. When the, e, when the A peak, sorry, hits the baseline, to when the E peak starts. So you can consider that the IVCT and the aortic ejection time and the NFT are kind of combined together a little bit, uh, where they're, we're looking at similar things. And if we go to the report, uh, you'll actually get the myocardial performance index measured in two different ways one using the IVRT, IVCT, and one using the NFT, AAT. So that's where those placements go. So the AT is this, is this ejection here. The NFT, the non-flow time, is the whole span between the A and the E. IVCT is here, and IVCT are here. Great. So when you're placing those points, are you actually using the, that zoom window on the left side to really hone in on, the, on exactly where you want to start yes, and uh, end those points. Yeah, I am actually, and that's, that's a good point. Whenever you select a measurement off of here, you get uh, the zoom window that shows up here on the on the left side or over here, so this area here is the zoom window. So you can see in closely uh, how to place those measurements. And, and when I'm placing these measurements specifically, especially with the ones like the IVCT and, uh, and the IRT that are in very small spans, I'm using a combination of uh, the sweep speed out, so making the whole trace a little wider so that you can really see where to place them, and then looking in the zoom window here uh, to really, uh, home in on where to place those those, uh, those points. I'm just going to take one, there are actually two questions that came in from different listeners, both about anesthesia, so I thought we could probably tackle uh, both of them at once. Um, one that's asking which anesthesia is used, and I'm assuming that's for, for the majority of images we see here, and I think you mentioned isofluorine. Yes. Um, the other thing was just about for optimal imaging, uh, should the inhalant isofluorine be shallow as possible, or do you have an optimal isofluorine flow rate? Um, so, I've we found 
um, and going around to all the different labs and different users and, and the work here. Um, my, everybody has sort of different approaches, but my personal preference is to try to keep the animals as light as possible. Um, what I talked about earlier with the looking at the uh, heart rate and, uh, and the temperature, so I prefer to try to keep the animals light, to try to keep the heart rate up high, and, uh, and again, just to monitor the temperature uh, with the heat lamp. So I would say generally set the flow rate at around 1 to 1.5 on the vaporizer when I'm, when I'm imaging um, mice and for rats, maybe sometimes a little bit higher, although I, I do try to keep the rats pretty light too. So 1, 1.2, 1 1.5. Um, in terms of the uh, flow rate on the vaporizer for the, uh, the propellant, either oxygen or metal air, um, try to keep the flow rate on at around 0.8. Um, I think some of the earlier uh, documentation, some of the earlier training stuff that we have said, I think one, I can't remember if it's liters per minute or milliliters per minute. I can't remember what the scale is. Um, I keep it actually a little bit lower, try to keep keep it at around 0.8 for mice. Uh, you do have to drive it up a little bit higher for rats, uh, sometimes just because of the increased body weight. Um, that's what, I, what I've generally found uh, with ISO. Now, uh, there are people out there using different things like SIVA frame, uh, which I've never had a chance to use. Um, and I've seen people using um, injectables, things like penobarbital or ketamine xylazine, which are not recommended for cardiovascular imaging. They uh, really depress the blood pressure and, uh, and the, the physiology is kind of all over the place. So we found that uh, light isofluorine and tight temperature control, uh, try to keep the temperature up high, uh, close to the animal's normal body temperature, really um, uh, set off the top. The, if you monitor the body temperature, then the uh, um, then uh, the heart rate will fall as long as the isofluorine is light. Okay. Yeah. I can take well, you know, one uh, one last question because we're we're running a little uh, on time at this point. I don't want to keep people. Um, Stephen, I'm going to throw this one at you. I'm not sure if you actually have any of this data or not. Um, so aortic valvular flows and pulmonary flows. Uh, do we have any of that? Data and also for aortic stenosis and pulmonary hypertension. Okay. So general question just about those particular yeah. models, and I'm not sure if you have that data. I do have pulmonary. Um, I've got some good pulmonary images here. So these are just ones that I took off of a normal animal uh, here at the lab. Um, so this is just a mode um, up from, you can actually see the progression if we go back to the long axis, which is over here. So you actually see the progression of going from long axis slightly towards the, um, the uh, aortic, the, and then tweaking the plane of view slightly here to get the pulmonary. So this is the pulmonary flow here, the, flow, the aortic uh, outflow tractor here, and here. Side. And if we go to color Doppler, is where you can really see it. Uh, so we've got really good pulmonary flows here. You can see in the blue here, there's very slight aliasing of the color as the blue uh, jet of the alias is over to, there it is, to, uh, and then into yellow and red. So this is the, the really velocity area of flow. And then if we go to the pulmonary uh, PW Doppler, I think I've got, here we go, this is the best one right here. So some good pulmonary uh, PW Doppler flows right here. Again, these are normal animals. Um, there's a set of uh, measurements here. So a few different measurements. The pulmonary is kind of interesting because uh, multiple measurements, you can actually measure the RVOT, the pulmonary, and the pulmonary artery. So these, uh, measurements give you the ability to go from one side of the valve to the other. So if you're taking um, if you're Doppler measurements upstream of the valve in the RVOT, uh, the valve, if you, and then downstream of the valve in the pulmonary artery. So these are really functional, again, if you're looking at uh, pulmonary hypertension models. Uh, once, once you have your PW Doppler trace, the standard, pretty much the standard measurements would, uh, would apply. You've got um, pulmonary artery, so uh, the VI measurements, the volume time integral measurements, so we'll just place those really quickly. That gives you a nice 
measure of the volume time integral, uh, part BTI, velocity, and the pressure gradients. Um, you can measure the pulmonary magnitude. Uh, two uh, that I uh, that are on here that I do in the pulmonary, and I would also do in the aorta. And again, we'll just take the speed. We'll stress the sweep speed out because we want to have. We're going to focus on this peak here. We're going to measure the pulmonary acceleration and the pulmonary ejection. So we measure the acceleration from the from where it starts to the center. And that's actually why I'm using this one because I already have the center marked. And then the ejection time is going to be the full run from the start over to finish. Uh, uh, acceleration. So the uh, upslope here, and then ejection time. So these are both baseline measurements. This is a, these are useful in pulmonary hypertension models when you're uh, looking at the flows uh, changing in the in the pulmonary uh, pulmonary uh, artery. Um, this same set of measurements I would do also in the aorta at the valve, looking at uh, aortic stenosis models as well. Um, I don't think I have any pulmonary hypertension images, uh, but I think I do have uh, I have a aortic images that I can show. Yes, I do. Actually, I don't like that one. But look at uh, the aorta mode. Supersternal view, um, and again the the different views: uh, the long axis, the apical four chamber, the supersternal view. These are uh, laid out in our uh, imaging guide. So if you uh, grab a copy of the imaging guide, you can uh, take a look and see what different types of views are. Um, you can see the color Doppler uh, here. So I've switched to in B mode. I've gone directly to PW Doppler, and I think this one actually has a set of measurements in it here. Yeah. So this. In the aorta, and um, same set of measurements: peak velocity, VI, aortic ejection, and aortic acceleration time. Looking at um, stenosis models, uh, these are obviously going to change. Uh, and then, if you're looking at pulmonary hypertension models, again, uh, those values are going to be all over the place. Uh, the, the different measurements are there to allow you to uh, to look at those different types of models. Uh, I mentioned the different measurements that are available in the pulmonary. This so is the uh, OT, the valve, and the actual artery itself. Similarly, you have some different options in the aortic protocol as well. You've got the uh, LVOT and actually measuring uh, within the aortic outflow tract. So you can measure on one side of the valve and the other. So that gives you a little bit of flexibility. Great. I think just in the interest of time, we're running a little bit past uh, 9 o'clock here. And I, I actually just want to say I think it's been a great session. I want to uh, Stephen for uh, for all his time and effort and, uh, and putting in the, the detail of to answer these questions and, and getting all this data together. Um, this will be a new format for us today, this Q and A type session. Um, but I, I mean, personally for me, it was really satisfying just to see the level of detail that, that users are getting to the questions they're asking. Um, it's really very exciting to see. So. Again, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, in the event, I know there's a few questions we didn't we didn't get to every single question. Um, we will follow up with you with answers and take some of these discussions offline. Uh, we'll also be emailing you uh, both a survey uh, and a recording of today's session. If please time and fill out the survey, we'd we'd love to hear your comments on the on today's format and the content. If there's anything you'd like us. To, uh, to change or do differently in future sessions. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, again, thanks to everyone. We'll send a link with the survey and the recording. Please check out our website for upcoming webinars. You can see the link here on the screen, visualsonics.com slash webinars. And I hope from, from many of you soon. Uh, so again, thank you, Stephen, and thanks everyone for, for listening. Uh, and we'll be email us. And email Either Andrew or myself or both or uh, VSI support if you've got any other questions to uh, to follow up on or anything that we didn't get to or anything you want some clarification for. Uh, and I are both available to uh, help. Right. Emails uh, we've just put up. Uh, 
uh, you'll see in the chat window uh, our emails and also the, uh, the link to the customer website. I do encourage you to, to take a look at that imaging guide on the, the customer website. Uh, there's quite a, quite a wealth of information there uh, to help you answer any of the questions. Um, so again, thanks everyone and hopefully to speak to you again soon. Bye for now.